guests who are going to find something interesting if you didn't know that there are Jew, there were Jews living in Brantford. Uh, the background gives you an idea of the farming community. We were a very small little town and um, mainly, um, yeah, we were about 60 kilometers away from Bloom, Bloemfontein, which was really the center that we went to a lot. It was a farming area. There was cattle and wheat and dairy and maize and friendly, friendly farmers. We spent a lot of time on farms, getting to know the people and playing in their dams and riding horses, etc. So um, according, as you know, to the heyday of Brantford, there were 117 souls in Brantford. You are looking here, and I'm so proud of my Boba Fega, I'm named after her, and my Zayda, um, Aaron Zelik. So he was a successful businessman. He owned a beer factory, and they had two sons. One, two, three. Father. Sorry? Yeah. Can I? Yeah? Mm. Carry on, my, Somebody's on YouTube. Okay, Solomon um, on the left and his brother Eric on the right. And what happened with my grandfather was being a successful Jewish businessman in Dvinsk in Latvia, um, he was um, shot in the village square and murdered. And the Boba made sure that the children left at a very tender age. Uh, tickets were bought for them and they left by boat. They could not speak a word of Engels and they learnt English as they came to South Africa. They then went to um, our uncle and auntie Zagori, who were in Aberdeen, and my dad and my uncle Eric Sharon, they worked in the shop there and then decided to leave. And they found themselves in the Free State, in the Orange Free State those days. There is Solomon. And there is my mom, Bessie Sharon, Bessie Zangwill, beg your pardon. So my dad goes to this little village where there is a small, small community and then needs to get, wants to get married, marries my mom, as I said, from Krimstadt. And that's actually his brother, Eric, um, on the right-hand side there behind him. So great joy in that marriage. And then they came to Branford. So that was 1940, came to the little village and started a life. Um, you see them as older people. Our family also are the Babros, and they're at Louis and Iris Babros' home, having a very wonderful, happy time. By then, they had moved to Cape Town. So what, what were my parents really, um, what was life like? My brother and I are born, my brother Norman and myself, and we grow up happy in that tiny little village. We ride horses, we ride our bikes towards nine o'clock in the evening on a beautiful summer's evening. Um, we have many friends and also of the local community, there are uh, quite a few Jewish people of our age and we mixed with everybody and it was absolutely a very happy upbringing. You see also there's a little copy that's a bit too quick. Can we just go back a little bit? Um, I just want to say there's also a little copy in the background, the only little hill in Branford we used to climb and we used to have a lot of fun there. To say that then my brother and I were sent to boarding school at the age of nine, pretty tender age. Uh, I went to UNICE where there were about 120 or sorry, close even to 200 Jewish girls from all around the country who came to that boarding school. And I, I really believe my brother went to St. Andrews again as well. There were many, um, many Jewish kids that came to those schools. And I really feel very grateful when I think that my, my folks were like start up people in a new uh, village and um, they sacrificed a lot to, to give us the education that, that I believe I, I wouldn't be sitting here today had I not had those opportunities. But to, to paint a picture further of the village, of my mom and dad, my dad was a shopkeeper because that's what so many people did. You'll find out soon what the others did. And um, my dad taught himself English. So Shakespeare being his favorite that he read. And we grew up with classical music in our home as well. And that was that. My mom, in actual fact, was a much more down-to-earth type of a person, loved gardening, loved friends. Here you see the community that I grew up with. 
these the, the picture of, of um, myself with all these people, wonderful, wonderful members of our community, the Levines. Um, there's Neville. His sister Jen is not in at the moment, but we will see her. The Sloans, Laura, Mark. I do feel I want to mention them. Matthew Shefts, Ray Shefts, Mrs. Gerson, Betty Levine, and L uh, Lily, who played a huge part in, in our lives. Selma Levy and Haim. So we would play with the kids and the children in Bradford. We'd swim, there was a pool, but of course it was a very conservative town. So it would be girls at one time and then boys, uh, the hour would be given for girls and then an hour for the boys. So, I mean, as I say, it was a very, very little quiet town in that way. Our holidays were also spent, um, Sundays, holidays, went to Marzal Squirt, went to a lot of members of family. We stayed a lot with family in Kronstadt, Renegen, Johannesburg, Kessel. And when it came, what you see there, the building that you see there is um, a communal hall that was built uh, during the time of um, us living there. And so much happened there. You know, there would be a, a broca lunch. Um, all the, the ladies would get together and, and do the baking and the picking and, and, and that sort of thing. So um, we were extremely happy, but you haven't yet seen our shawl, so maybe we can... And, and get to that, I'd like to just, if it's the next one, I'd like to just well, share about that. Um, <laughs> I'll try, it seems to be stuck. It's stuck. Okay, so I'll just chat while you get that picture. Yeah, well, I, I might stop share and share again, so okay. That's okay. Are you um, going to keep talking? I can, I can keep talking, okay. So basically, what I can say is that we're quite a, a closely knit community. And you will see the picture of the shul, which was built, if I have my facts correct, around in the 1900s, about 1907. And um, we had a Reverend Reuben there well before my day. And then when we had Reverend Batlin and his wife, um, he was actually the father of Sophie Cotson. So there'd be many people who'd uh, be included in, in this whole web. Um, so he was evidently a jeweler when he came to Brantford, and that's how he made his living, until they heard his voice. He evidently had a magnificent voice, and a rabbi told him he should go to London to study being a rabbi, a reverend, which is what he did. So he travelled to London, leaving his family in the village, and learned to be a shochet. There he is, a very... Um, imposing man, I would say. And so he led the Branford community until his death in 1933. Um, so he was actually the resident um, reverend of the place, Mrs. Um, Batlin as well. And he did shocketing, a killing of the animals in a kosher style, and uh, they taught cheda. So there, it was quite a thriving community in that way. What I recall with, with great um, amazement is that when we would have a holiday, a hug, um, we would find uh, the men, young men who studied at the Agricultural College in Glen, which was, say, 20 minutes away from us, they'd come and make a minyan. We'd have guys from the army came to make a minyan. So we really, our holidays, our chagim, were really very, very positive and just beautifully done. We had what I, I, I must mention that a member of our community, Alec Levine, blew the shofar and he became renowned for that. As a matter of fact, the late Rabbi Maisel's remarked on, on that. Are you able to, to move it further or not, Geraldine? Is that, oh, is that the picture that you wanted? Oh, okay. Oh, there we have it. So uh, if I point, will you be able to see? Or would you like to? Um, well, I'll use point. It as, you. You'll point. Okay, that is Mr. Max Klavansky, and um, we knew him himself. He was actually sort of our cantor when, you know, the others had passed away, the reverence that I spoke about. And in the front, we have Mr. Kalish, yes, on the right, and right next to him, Mr. Tulpers. Now, they were all uh, bachelors, and they were gentlemen farmers. So we used to go out and visit their farms, and that was actually quite remarkable. And uh, a few moments before this uh, Zoom, 
I received, which I'm going to read, and I want to thank you, Theo, Mr. Theo Klavansky. I had no idea. Now we know that Max came from Lithuania. Um, yes, he was a sheep farmer, and he went first of all to Newton Hague and then to Port Elizabeth. So um, when he arrived in Brantford, this I found actually very interesting, was they said here that um, many Afrikaners who met him welcomed him as a representative of the people of the book. I find that amazing because I must say we were very, very well received by the local people, both black and white in our community. I neglected to mention the Immerman family. I see Sally Immerman there. Can you see how happy, what a wonderful hug all of us are together. Um, so it, it, it just brings warm memories to me of the village that we had then. And that's that's the you. Last, and is that your mother? Oh, you want to show, oh, that's my mom, Bessie Sharon. I'm next door to her. That's, and my dad is next to us there. And my brother is uh, behind Mr. Kalish. And just by the way, on the right is um, a fellow called Raymond Donner. He used to come on his motorbike um, to have Friday nights with us at our shul and to do the Ontavian. So, and, and here I see many uncles and aunts, as well as the Levines, um, if there are any Levines watching. And of course, um, we used to call him Ginger, Mr. Sloan, and his wife, Nellie. So, yeah, the, the last Jews to leave our village were the Levines, in actual fact. Um, they left in 1981. So, yeah, what the, the, the Jews did there, other work was that they were, as I spoke about gentlemen farmers, shopkeepers, the Levines had two very, three actually successful businesses, and um, so did okay. the Immermans. And I'm trying to think, yeah, there's our shul. I want you to know that that little shul had a special space for children. So we had our own little seats. I had my own personal little Torah. The women were upstairs, the men downstairs, and um, everybody uh, was part of a wonderful community. I have wonderful memories and still actually enjoy going to, to my shul, and I believe that's um, those are the roots that, that, that I came from that taught me that. Okay. Um, we One see minute. we could go to Reverend Batlin's grave. That would be fine. Oh, we, yes. we oh, oh, let's, we've got that. That's great. So we had a tailor. Um, Mr. Hillman, I think it was, and the Levies that I mentioned, Dave and Fanny Levy, they ran the commercial hotel. There was also the Grand National Hotel, and I found this in the archives. So the Brahma family, that would that would link, if Dougie Zeman is possibly watching, that would be linking with the Zeman family, and they paid an IOU of five shillings for younger people who don't know what that is. So I think that was amazing, the Grand National Hotel. And um, many um, they call them smosa. Many travelers would come to the hotel and spend a night, and many of them were entertained by the Brantford community. Um, so that was a very warm community. There, were, there was a Mr. Heyman Hoffman, who was a lawyer, and Jack Hoffman, a caterer, and the Kessel family. They were a childless couple, and they owned the Grand National. They were the last to own the Grand National Hotel. And um, so... Let me just think what took me back to Brantford. So I had been married in Cape Town happily. I just want to mention one thing, that my brother Norman Sheeran had a bar mitzvah in 1956. And in the country, you didn't have caterers as you have now. So our moms were the caterers, and they were the bakers, and they were the cooks, and they catered magnificently. And all our cousins would run in and out of the kitchen and pinch biscuits and you know, that was our good family time. The last person to have his bar mitzvah in Brantford was in 1964, and that was Neville Levine. Actually, I'm speaking about people who are late, the late. So I have not been to Brantford to take me back to that. And I, I, I decided to go to a reunion at my school after many, many years. So I went to the, the reun reunion in Bloemfontein, and I hired a car took myself down to the village half an hour away. And I remember having a look at the grid and seeing it was 
eight streets this way and eight streets that way. I sat and I laughed and I thought, how could we have had such a happy childhood in such a tiny place? But we really, really did. So what um, happened was I went around and I had a look at the places where the Jewish people had lived, the shops that I spoke about, the houses that we lived in. And there wasn't a sign to say that any Jews had lived in that village. And this really started disturbing me. One interesting thing that happened when I went outside to our home, which was in Kitely Street, and my, my dad so proudly had that built by an architect called Mr. Henk de B, who came from Bloemfontein to build, and he was so proud of that home. I looked at it and I thought, sure, nobody really knows that there were any Jews here in this village. And as I stopped, a man walked past me, and I just said to him in Afrikaans, I will translate. I said, my mom and my pa are here geboren. Ek is, ek is here geboren. My mom and dad were born here, were, were lived here, and I was born here. And he looked at me, and he said, and how is your brother Norman? And who can't have met Norman? And the man was Daniel, our gardener. Now, what were the chances of this phenomenal thing? So then I decided to go down. I went to the cemetery, and the burrs and the weeds were yay high. And I thought, no, this doesn't seem right to me. This does. So the, the picture that, that will be shown of Reverend Batlin in the grave happened afterwards. So if you ask me, what was your motivation in writing this? I, I just knew that I couldn't leave things as they were. So I went down. Our main um, street was called the Voortrekker Street, but no surprises. And I went into the HF Root Library. And I asked the librarian for a book on Bradford. Had a look and saw, yes, the three churches are there, but, but anything to show the Jews had lived there, absolutely not. So that clearly became my motivation. I left there not realizing that I was going to be being at the Bloemfontein reunion, going back to Cape Town, and I said to Ivor, I have to do something about it. And what happened was many interviews, many then tape recorders, et cetera, recordings. <laughs> uh, Gary Sussman just says my late father visited and he didn't realize where he went to, but it was Brantford. Um, so I decided to interview many, many people, and it was actually fantastic because they really came out of the woodwork, as I hope this will happen today, that there, there were more things that we could say about people that we didn't know. So families got together, told me about their history. I collated it, got calls in those days from Canada, a, a family, a Bernice Tsvi, and her family came from Drikopen, and that meant three heads, that's the redheads, there were three redheads in the family. So we used to go out to their farm. Uh, just to mention that the name for Wurt we, is synonymous with the Prime Minister, but I won't go into that. I will say that his dad, Mr. Verwurt, was from Holland and he had a fantastic bookshop, which my dad spent a lot of time in and spent a lot of time with him. So we were actually very friendly with the local people. They were very accommodating, very friendly towards us. I would just like to, yes, speak. Yeah, I want to say that, so Ivan and I went back, we did a road trip and we went back to Bradford to launch the book um, about Bradford, which is now posted, Geraldine has told me that. And we wrote a letter, can we just be on Winnie for a moment, please? We wrote a letter to Winnie Matikathela Mandela because what happened was we all probably know that she was incarcerated to Brantford uh, because it was a tiny, tiny little village in the back of beyond and not treated particularly well. So she went into the shop of the Levines. She walked in and the lady who served her said, well, you, you have to go around to the other section, so-called the native section. You know, you can't go in here. And Winnie, being the feisty personality that she was, she said, absolutely not. I've come to buy and I want to buy now in this store. And Morris Levine came forward and he said, you are free to buy anything, any shop that you choose. And she then called, you'll see a picture of them soon, Lily, and Betty Levine, her white sisters. And she spoke about the amazing support she got 
and I, I, I would like to, to read this because I think it's quite important what she said. Um, I recall fondly the support and help given to me by some members, those would be particularly the Levines, because we had left already, um, of the small Brantford community, the Jewish congregation, such as, as oh, she mentions, Mr. and Mrs. Levine. I was extremely grateful for the kindness shown to me by the Jewish community. Had it not been for them, I would not have survived the brutality of apartheid. They understood what it was to be persecuted and have played a great role in helping me and Zinzi cross the racial line under very difficult circumstances. So I, I really felt very grateful about that. What happened then is we launched the book and um, if we could go to the next one, the next slide. And here we are, proud. There's Rabbi Silverhawk. He was phenomenal, so amazing, so helpful. Nothing was too much for Rab Silverhawk. Also, if I could mention the late um, Suzanne Belling, um, she wrote about Branford afterwards with Rabbi Silverhawk. And there we all are, you know. There's Betty Levine in the middle next to Michael. And um, that's my brother and I at the back. And there's Chaim, we called him Humpy. And there is um, Jennifer Levine in the middle in the front. And Mark Sloan came down with Mark uh, on the right. So it was a fantastic meeting. And the nicest thing for me was Councillor Marfel was there. Steve, um, I think he was Steve. Just let me think, um, there was Reuben Mayer, he, he was in, in the township um, library, there were two libraries, and I wanted to launch the book in the library where I was not allowed to go, which was the, the Black Township, and Anna, Anna, I know that you are listening together with your family, um, and I just want to say Dumela. I spoke uh, the Sutu language as a child. And so I invited um, the, the students, the high school students of the Machadiso School, and they came, they attended, they were part of everything when we launched the book. You can see how lovely the library is. And also many of the non-Jewish Christian people came, some blue shofars. I wonder if that was to remember Alec Levine. So um, for me, it's a circle that doesn't close because if anybody has any information that you'd like to share, now we know where to go and you can read up further. And I just want to thank everybody so much for listening. And it was just my pleasure. And I feel the book has come home. Thank you. Thank you so much. And here's the, the, the picture of the cemetery, which is now being cared for by the local community. Correct. That's BT. And Hello. Me. Hello. Is it possible I can say something? Just in a minute, okay. Um, and that's, <laughs> that's the end. So, okay. So now it might, I'll stop sharing and we could go to um, see if anybody wants to say something. To, Hello. It, it would be good to, if you can um, raise your hand, if you know how to do that. Um, okay, Theo, let's, let's you go first. Uh, right. Thank you very much. So thank you. This was uh, an absolute delight yeah. to see, and it brought back uh, wonderful memories. I was all of three years old in 1942 when I first met my uncle Max in Brownford. So he was a sheep farmer at that stage and he brought a little lamb uh, so that I could see what one of his sheep looked like. And, uh, and the lamb deposited uh, on my knee. <laughs> I, was, I was absolutely distressed by that, of course. So the other thing I wanted to mention was, you mentioned Eunice. So um, we've spoken about the Kavanskis, which is my father's side, and um, the connection that I have with Kimberley is through my mother's side, the Blumenthal's. And uh, three of my cousins went to Eunice, the Horn Girls, Jennifer, Barbara, and Marilyn, you know them. Absolutely. 
definitely. Yeah. Oh, wow. So, uh, okay. the, very the close circle, memory. The circles okay. are very small. And uh, we, um, Hilda, the girl's mother, arranged for many of us cousins from the Blumenthal side of the family to spend Julys in uh, in Stainsrust, where, where they lived. And uh, on Friday uh, afternoons, we would go through to the to uh, to the Schul in Kronstadt for oh. Friday night service. So uh, you know the the memories are there. And so nice to meet you in such a small world, isn't it? Yeah. Indeed. Absolutely. It's lovely that we've got this forum where we can meet together. Is anybody else would like to say something about um, um, Itamar? Itamar. Hello. Itamar. Well, uh, yeah, I come from Bloemfontein. I'm now living in London. Thank you very much for this fantastic uh, uh, memory uh, lane, or that I've been down uh, now. Um, I remember Fasia and Norman quite clearly. Mm -hmm. Oh, lovely. Um, Thank you. Norman was at St Andrews. I was at Gray College. We used to meet at Shaw, the Bloemfontein Shaw. Uh, I think he did come a couple of times. So some of the other St Andrew boys used to come to our house for Friday nights. Yes, I came to um, And we used to meet at Harbonim uh, on Sunday mornings quite a lot. Uh, I remember the... Um, the Horn girls, Barbara and Jennifer, quite clearly. Um, and also my dad had this uh, wholesale business in Bloemfontein and he used to travel the free states all over the show. And on occasions I used to partake of uh, or go with him. I also did a bit of traveling in my varsity holidays. And I remember going and looking at the uh, Brentford Shul few times. Oh, I remember uh, going down the main street um, in my dad's 1949 Ford. Um, there was a, a, one guy that I do remember that you didn't, didn't mention. He's a chap shopkeeper by the name of Cohen. I don't know whatever oh, happened to Cohen, but he yes. made some impression on me somehow. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Pardon? May I speak? Yep. Yes, I, I absolutely apologize. You're right. He was a bachelor, Udall Cohen. He had yep. a shop near the station. Thank you. Quite right. Yeah. Um, and also, I think we the Habonim camps, you know, were, took place in Fontonda's farm, which was six miles outside Bloemfontein on the, Blumf on the Brentford Road. Um, which was quite fun. I, I don't remember the St. Andrews boys, they loved their uniforms all day, day and night, and so did the Unisi girls. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we just seemed to meet in Shul or on the weekend mm -hmm. somewhere along the line. Thank you. The, Thank the you. Other yeah. The other yes. Klevansky uh, connection, I don't mm -hmm. know, there used to be a fellow who used to, he was the sort of uh, inspector of Haders. He came from uh, Johannesburg, I think. I don't know if it was part of the Klevansky family. <laughs> I but think... I do remember him to, trying to inspect uh, my Haida teacher and sort of, I don't know, they, they had some conversation which was a little bit beyond me, probably. <laughs> can I? Theo yeah, will tell you. Theo yeah, will tell you. Can I, can I just say one thing, please? Um, Mrs. Brower, who lives in, in Cape Town, was actually a Haida teacher. So. In blue. Um, I think that uh, I also think that uh, Briner, a bigger pardon, Briner. Uh, Norman uh, married a married a girl, I believe, and, he, and she lived in Greenside, or they lived in Greenside. Correct. And we used to meet from time to time at a restaurant in Greenside. Where we, I don't know, we met there from time to time, and it was okay. quite. Thank, thank you, Itama. I think we before we get too uh, far into personal memories. Don't forget, we've got some wonderful other people to talk. But Gary, did you want to just say something quickly? And I know that Theo just wants to tell you that that was his father. Indeed. Yep. That was, <laughs> that was my father. He became the traveling inspector of Hebrew schools yeah. all over South Africa. Actually, interestingly, with the exception of Cape Town, 
but for the rest of South Africa and indeed Southern Rhodesia, he traveled uh, for so many years as the traveling inspector of Hebrew schools of Chodorin around the country. So I, have right. lots of I have lots of correspondence with him in the private community. He used to come and inspect and he was involved in trying to find rabbis for all these small communities. It was kind of a <laughs> very tough job because they couldn't find rabbis. I, I have a question. Um, is it so so I mean there were a lot of bachelor farmers like there were in in the in sort of Bechuana land I mean and in my research I found quite a few consorted with locals and kind of crossed racial divides I mean would you know I mean you know these Jewish bachelors you know they, they couldn't find Jewish partners I mean do you have a sense on on whether that happened in your community as well that is a fascinating question. You know, it would have been absolutely taboo <laughs> if my mom and dad were around hearing that. I have no clue. I just saw Mr. Klavansky stayed at the hotel. He, he resided at the commercial hotel. And that's kind of as a little girl where I saw him. And the other two, I, I, I wouldn't actually know, but they were on a farm. I, I can't answer you. Very okay. interesting question. <laughs> Okay, uh, Myra, just something quick, unmute, and then uh, we'll we'll go on to Josh in series. We can't hear you, Myra, because you're still muted. Um, just hold down your space bar if you're on a computer, and you will be able to hear you. Um. I'd just like to know, are you related to the Klebanskis that were in Kimberley? Is that a question for Thea? Yes. Um, okay, well, well let's come. Not that I know of. I don't I don't I didn't come across the name of Klebansky in Kimberley, but I know that there were four spellings of Klebanskis between K L A and K L E and K L E V and K L E W. So there were four, uh, yeah, four yeah. different spellings. But, uh, okay. Thank, thank you, and thank you for all the excited questions and, and comments. Um, Fazia was wonderful to to know about um, Brantford, and it's very co commendable that you decided. You know, people should know about it, and and Absolutely. to hear from somebody who really enjoyed living there is a wonderful way of of doing that. So now I'm going to call on Josh uh, Khan, who spent his family has been in uh, the series era area for over a hundred years. To tell you, he lives in uh, Prince Al Alfred Hamlet, and he'll tell us all about that. Uh, so if you now go back to your speaker view. Uh, we invite everybody else to mute themselves, but Josh Khan to unmute and talk to us about um, series. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to go to the share screen. Uh, okay. Lovely. And you be seen. Uh, just a quick little bit about myself and my family, because this is about the Syrian Hebrew congregation. My parents came to the village of Prince Alfred Hamlet, which is nine kilometers outside Syrus in 1940 on honeymoon. The reason for their visit was coming here was that family were in their hotel business and a cousin farm nearby. My mother was born in Poland and my father from Plunyan in Lithuania, where my grandfather was a farmer. Strange enough, when my parents arrived here, my father found many Plunyaners, which was rather interesting. I myself went to junior school in series and high school at Weinberg Boys High, where Ivan Perl was as well. I've lived here permanently since 1965 and I've made, been married to Gwen since 1969. I was a hotelier for 40 years of my life, and I think I must be about the last surviving breed of the country hotelier. We have four children and four grandchildren who live in Cape Town 
and a granddaughter who's finishing her schooling in Israel. Um, this picture on the screen is actually the visitor's book from Hamlet Hotel. And um, you will see on the 9th of May, 1940, Mr. H.I. Khan arrived. That's my father. And funny enough, the only other yet in town was another Mr. Khan whose signature is just above him on the page. The Jewish presence in Sirius goes back a long, long time. Adolf Arnolds was a storekeeper and he lived with his wife, Mary, in series in 1965. 1865. Oh, sorry, 1865. Now, the background to series is quite important because the Forgotten Highway to the North ran through a series. Um, the drill head was at Wellington, and from then everybody moved the diamond fields to the gold fields by wagon. And that main road ran through a series. And Mr. Arnold started the um, passenger transport company called the Inland, Inland Transport Company with the head office in series. It was like the Joel's of the era. Let's just move the slide on. Um, he was also the first mayor of series, uh, the first magistrate of series. So the Jews in series played a pretty important role. Uh, there's an advert for his transport company. For £12, you could go to the diamond fields. Another early occupant of series was Ludwig Wiener, and he traded in Sirius and in Tolbach between 1855 and 1870. The Bowmans were also going back quite a long way into the history of series. And he was the man who, in 1923, laid the foundation stone of the first Shulin series. This is just a list of the presence in series and when people more or less arrived here. The series Hebrew congregation was formed in 1903. And um, in 1923, a shul was built on the corner of Porter Street and Munich Street. The foundation stone, as I said, was laid by Mr. Bowman. And in 1964, there were still, uh, skip by 28 families. This is wrong what I have on my slide, 28 families and members to the shul. This is actually the foundation stone laying ceremony in 1923. This stone is now at the Jewish Museum in Cape Town. And another interesting story is that the trowel that Mr. Bowman used to lay that stone disappeared. And it was found some years ago in a bankrupt jewelry shop in Petersburg in the Transvaal. And somebody said, but whoa, there's this a congregation in series that must go back there. And it is today in the museum in series. Um, as far as I know, there were three rabbis who served the community. Reverend Moshe Rabinovitz, 1905 to 1921. And then there was a gap. I think there could well have been somebody, I must research it further. But Rabbi Natus, Herschel Natus, served the community in series from 1927 to 1953. In fact, the first Hebrew I learned was from him. And this picture is Reverend Natus leaving Lithuania for, 90, for South Africa in 1926. Um, in 1944, the Cirrus, Tolbach and Wolseley congregates, congregations amalgamated to perform what is known as the Cirrus Wolseley Hebrew Congregation, and the chairman then was Mr. M. Friedman. Uh, the reason for Rabbi Natus coming to Ceres is that he had a deaf and dumb daughter, and she was at school at the uh, school for those people in Worcester, and it was convenient for him to live in Ceres. He did the shechting, he did everything. He was a marvelous, marvelous man. 
uh, to talk about all the people that lived in Ceres is impossible. But there are a few that I would like to elaborate on. One of them was Raskin's mineral water factory, Mr. Isaac Raskin. And if you look at the mineral water, the ginger beer bottle, it's quite interesting in that it says Raskin and Company, and along the bottom, Cirrus and Cirrus Road. Cirrus Road is what is today known as Wolseley. He made med for Pesach. It was super. Um, farmers, the fruit farming industry was pioneered by Jewish farmers. Uh, the Sarambachs, in particular, Joseph Sarambach, he came from Prussia. In fact, the farm is still called Klein Preuss. And he became the biggest fruit exporter in South Africa in that time. Uh, the Zionist record of October 1933 records that Mr. Sarambach traveled extens extensively in Canada and the, and the United States where he studied fruit culture. He subsequently decided to become a grower and purchased a farm in Ceres. Last season, he shipped 1,500 tons of fruit overseas, besides many thousands of packages on local markets. Now, 1,500 tons of fruit by today's standards is a lot. Another name in the fruit farming industry is the Kirsch family, Theo Kirsch. Um, he farmed at a farm called Ostasi, and he was one of the founders of the big cooperative called Cirrus Fruit Growers in Ceres. This picture is some of the traders in Ceres. On the left is Wolf Meta. He had a shop in Ceres. He, when Rabbi Natus retired, he was the gabo of our shul. The only thing he couldn't do was a bris. Picture in the middle is Kirsch's store. And the picture on the right is Saki Katzenellenbogen standing on the road called the Saki Katzenellenbogenweg. That's in Wolseley. And Saki in his time was also the mayor of Wolseley. The Shul Hall was built in 1933. You'll see the quotation on the right for the royal sum of 775 pounds. This all came to a standstill in 1969 with the earthquake. The shul was and the hall, which is the building in the background of the three slides, were all damaged way beyond repair. Interestingly enough, on the night of the 29th of September, when this all happened, there was a ladies' WITSA meeting in Wolseley. Uh, I have the minute book in my safe. And uh, the uh, closing remark is, the meeting ended in chaos. Uh, fortunately, there was, nobody was hurt. Everybody returned to the series. Uh, that was in 69. By 1970, Yontif, we had a temporary shul. It was a steel structure enclosed. And that, with time, became the hall of the rebuilt shul. <laughs> The process was you turned your money over to the disaster fund, which was established, and we were fairly well insured. And we were promised to be put back into the position we were before the quake. That happened. We were able to rebuild the shul and the hall. Uh, the shul, in order for, for safety, we got permission from the rebuilding to build our shul on one level. The ladies were only two steps up. And um, they are hardly higher than what it was. Uh, this is the opening of the shul in 1973. The three gentlemen on the left is Wolfie Fish, who became the gubber after Wolf Meadows in the middle. And Rabbi Professor Newman is on the right, who um, uh, came to perform the opening ceremony. The picture on the left is the shul as it was. Then, uh, this is what this building looked like, um, the new building, and today it's been sold. The building essentially looks the same. The windows have been changed. The gateposts 
uh, are really the only original piece of the 1923 shul. Um, so the, the, it's actually 100 years this year that the first shul was built and 50 years ago that the second shul was built. The last service was held in our shul in 1999. Only high holidays were celebrated before that. And we used to get young people from Cape Town to come and run the menu for us. It was popular. Friends and family used to come from Cape Town for Yontif. Um, from Villiersdorp, Riversdale, they came to the series. In the 1950s, when I was a school and the congregation was really strong, it was obvious when it was Yontif, the village was quiet. Most of the businesses were closed. I think like most places when it was uh, lunchtime Rosh Hashanah, there was a brocha in somebody's house, everybody was invited. Bar mitzvahs were held at six o'clock in the morning so that shopkeepers could be at their businesses by eight o'clock. On Friday nights, if we're one or two short for a minion, there was a very popular big hotel across the road from the shul called the Belmont Hotel. Some of you might remember it. One of, one of us would run across the road, ask for the visitor's book, and uh, go down the list for Mr. Rabinovitz, Mr. Cohen, whatever, and there would be a phone call to their room. Please come and help us make a minion. And that happened. When we no longer used the shul, our furnishings were put in storage. And uh, we uh, rented the premises out as a Christian private school. The rental enabled us to do lots of things. We put a child from Rania through university. Uh, we were able to make various donations to Jewish uh, charities. And in that way, over 300,000 Rand was handed out. We also paid for a permanent exhibition in the museum because, as Fazia said, you go to a town today, there's no sign of a Jew. People wouldn't even know what a Jew is. And because of the role we played in the country towns, we felt that we must put something there for people to see and that we have achieved. But the foundation stone of the second shul is in, in that museum, as well as some of the windows with Magen David's on. The cemetery, uh, if anybody should research series, if you go to the, the series museum website, they are there. And um, we've put them all down at 30 degrees. This is some earthquake damage. Uh, they're very old tombstones in the cemetery. It's impossible to say, you will see the hollows in the headstones that were put down. There was probably a wooden plaque in there. But because of the fact that this that it was on the main road to the north, we assume that it was travelers that died and they were buried in Ceres. Um, this is the museum in Ceres. The picture on the le left shows you uh, one of the windows on the outside of the museum, which says there is Jewish history to be seen in the museum. And the picture on the right is the bench, the Rebbe's bench as well as the tablet from above the, the ark and the curtain from the ark. Um, often my wife and myself have spoken to school groups about Jews and the Sierra Hebrew congregation. And we have a fantastic curator and she's really bends over backwards to accommodate things like that. Thank you, and that's all I have to tell you. I'd be happy to ask answer questions. Just unmute myself. Um, thank you, Josh, so much for for this wonderful presentation. Um, you know, for people in other parts of the country, we we didn't realize maybe what was going on. So it's really tremendous. So, is there anybody who'd like to? ask um, Josh any anything or um, say anything. 
um, people are really enjoying these speak talks. Um, uh, so, get Hi. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Great. Hi. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, I just want to thank Joss for that talk. Uh, Joss is a, is a great friend of this museum as well as the museum and series. And uh, he's been singularly responsible for maintaining and securing the history of the series Jewish community. So I really just want to commend him on the work that he's done. Um, and uh, keep it up, Joss. I'll, uh, I'm sure, no doubt, I will see you soon. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Ivan. Uh, somehow we can't hear you, although you're not you're not muted, but we can't hear you. Maybe just write something in the chat, and we'll we'll uh, we'll see. Ivan and I, just as a matter of interest, were at boarding school together. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Okay, Gavin. So. And now that you've got your voice, will you, would you like to uh, introduce, uh, where's Gerald says he's in the waiting room. How many of you? <laughs> uh, no, I can see Gerald. Hi, Gerald. Um, yeah, thank you. Apologies for my lack of, um, of sound earlier. Um, next up, we're going to hear from Gerald Potash. Uh, Gerald uh, grew up in Stellenbosch. He went to school and university there. After practicing law for a short time in the city, he returned to Stellenbosch to run the family retail business. Uh, he did that for close to 30 years, and then on retirement became a Jewish tour guide who we see regularly bringing uh, tours of uh, and Jewish tourists through the South African Jewish Museum. So thank you for that, Gerald. Uh, Gerald also took uh, me and, and the rest of the Jewish Museum staff on one of our annual outings around Stellenbosch, where he walked us through the history of uh, the Stellenbosch Jewish community, community. So I expect to be a little bit familiar with what he's going to present. Um, Gerald, if you'll uh, unmute yourself and uh, you can take it away from there. Okay, so Gerald's obviously having difficulty unmuting himself. Ah. Can you, can you hear I had huge trouble. I could any of the came up from series, I'm getting a brief sound. So I hope you can. Gerald, we're having trouble hearing you. Can you speak up a little bit? Yeah, yeah, I, I'm in huge trouble. Uh, I'll, try uh, I'll try and make it louder. louder. Can, you can you hear me now? No. no. I'm just wondering if I you think you've got two devices, two devices. Gerald. I suspect you've got two devices on, and that's what's you've dialed in from two devices, and that's what's creating the echo. I, 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 if I, I, I lose I everything, lose so everything. So I, I, um, I tell you what, Gerald, why don't we go to Nati uh, while you sort yeah. yourself out, and then we'll come back to you. Uh, while you sort yourself out, and then we'll come back to you. Okay. Oh, but we're having an echo from you because, to, <laughs> you because Gerald is on two devices. Gerald, you just need to close one, please. Close one, please. Okay. Um, Gerald? Hello, I, I can hear you, but I can't see anything. I've got a blank screen in front of me. Okay, well, we can hear you. Can, we can hear you perfectly now. So, um, do you want me to start? Yeah, let's go for it. Okay, I, I want to start by saying that the first Jews that we know of were Adolf and Marsha Fisher, who arrived in Stellenbosch in 1890. The Stellenbosch Hebrew congregation, as such, first met in Mr. Brown, Mr. and Mrs. Brown's house in Hertha Street. And that was 23 years before the Shur Shul was built. So that was in 1900. So the Jewish community of Stellenbosch goes back to 1900. Mr. D. Deitch, who was the chairman, decided to start collecting money for Achados Achim, the Shul that was built in 1923. So this year, our Shul 
is exactly 100 years old. And we intend to have a celebration of types and ask all the old members who are all over the world to come and join us on Zoom or whatever, come to Stellenbosch to help us celebrate the 100th anniversary of the shul. After the, um, the, the, the Deitch for the shul, the shul actually meant to move to Plain Street where they even had a mikveh where is now the Boerland Bank building. If anybody knows Stellenbosch well enough on the big corner opposite what used to be the, yeah. the Vets corner, there's the uh, Boerland Bank building. And that was in fact the shul before we moved to the uh, current shul. The first wedding in Stellenbosch was the Zuckerman wedding. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Zuckerman got married in 1902 and their son, Solly, eventually became Sir Solly Zuckerman. And um, that was really the first Jewish wedding to take place in Stellenbosch. Then um, in 1903, Mr. Sonitsky became the, um, the chairman and started collecting money for the shul that was to be built in 1923 and completed with the Reverend Bender giving the, um, laying the cornerstone. In 1904, Mendel Zettler arrived from Eastern Europe and he bought a piece of, got himself a piece of land and started planting strawberries. And I don't have to tell you what he did thereafter. He divided land up, gave lots of patches of land. And most of you will know about the famous Moiberger statues that even today, uh, Dennis Zettler is running an enormous farm with uh, Bruckersdal next door to it and the Zettler farms. And they are strawberry farmers amongst other kinds of farmers and retailers at the same time and have developed their business magnificently. After the war, there was expansion in Stellenbosch. Uh, that's the, the, the Boer War and um, the Europeans came in quite quickly. And in 1923, when the shoe was in fact opened, people like the Dutch reform minister, the uh, Paul Ruiz, the, the, the principal of the high school, and the uh, people who were connected to the Semitic languages in the, at the university all attended the opening. And things went pretty well between the Jewish community in Stellenbosch and the major Afrikaans community. The, the, most of the people in Stellenbosch, as you all know, are Afrikaans speaking. In fact, it's interesting that um, even the Zettler boys, when they con and I'm talking about Sam Zettler's sons, not Butt Zettler's sons, and I'll come to Butt Zettler and Frieda in a moment, but when Sam Zettler's sons, uh, that was the late Michael and uh, late Jeffrey and Dennis and uh, Herschel and um, Leonard, when they conducted meetings on their farm, they were all speaking Afrikaans. And when I spoke to Herschel, who was uh, very much my age, I spoke to him in Afrikaans, to Dennis and to the late Jeffrey, I spoke in English. But most of us were pretty bilingual. Um, we all went to Paul Ruiz. Most of the affluent Jewish boys went to Weinberg Boys High. <laughs> they went to Cape Town schools, but we went to Stellenbosch School. Um, after the uh, Sanitsky became the chairman and the shoe went up and the foundation was made and the parties were had, there was a very close connection between the Jews and the Afrikaner uh, inhabitants or citizens of Stellenbosch, the people, the patrons of Stellenbosch. And that kind of changed with 1936 and the advent of the gray shirts and Dr. Favurt, who was at the university and D.F. Malan, who also became a prime minister, a, a strong opposition to Jewish immigration and uh, the, the situation sort of tapered down then. But by 1950, in fact, 1947, Reverend Pachter came to Stellenbosch and he was there for a mighty long time, 15 years. And um, he taught me my bar mitzvah and Reverend Pachter got on very well. Uh, he, I, I didn't realize that he was reasonably bilingual and um, Professor Tom and Professor, um, uh, oh, I've forgotten his name, it'll come back to me in a moment. The, the, the Dean of the Faculty of Semitic Languages, Professor Weiss, Professor Weiss. They were pretty friendly and um, Pacta never, never forgot to invite them to Jewish affairs in our shuls, in our halls. 
they were always part of the of, of the people that we that, that, that the Jewish people mixed with. Um, prof both Professor Tom and Professor Weiss, Professor Tom, who later became the dean of the faculty, uh, the dean of the university, the the, the vice chancellor, um, they he visited um, Israel in 1958 and Professor, Professor Weiss a few years earlier. So there was a very good relationship between the Jewish people of Stellenbosch and the Afrikaans academia. And let's face it, Stellenbosch is famous not only for strawberries and for grapes, but also for the university, which played such a big part in most of our lives. Um, I want to go on to the way I grew up and my view of Stellenbosch because Fazer did such a good job of hers. Um, I was, uh, my mom and my, my, my dad was in the army in 1944 when they got married. And when my mother was pregnant, she went up to Benoni where her mother and father lived. <laughs> Excuse me. And I was born in Benoni, but came straight back to Stellenbosch and spent my whole formative years there, school, university, and then came back for nearly 30 years to trade in my family business. <laughs> Excuse me. So when I was born, my mom told me that was 1945, that there were about 64 families, Jewish families in Stellenbosch. I apologize. You want to take another speaker? Thanks, Gerald. We'll uh, we'll come back to you in a little bit. Uh, you can just send me a private message in the meanwhile when you're ready. Okay, and um, we're going to go on now then to Nati. Um, Nati Finkelstein is a retired pharmacist and phytochemist. He was born in Beaufort West, which you'll tell us about in 1939. He matriculated from the Central High School in 1956 and moved to Cape Town in 1957. Um, he uh, celebrated his bar mitzvah in the Beaufort West Shul in 1952 and had the honor of having his second bar mitzvah in the Garden Shul last year. He's a son of the Karoo. Uh, he has a tremendous interest in what happens in Beaufort West. So, um, Nati, um, we're going to go over to you now. Uh, thanks, Gerald. We'll come back to you uh, once Nati's finished. Right. Thanks very much, uh, Gavin. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I'm going to share my screen now. Hmm. Right. Well, thank you very much uh, for the honor of uh, being able to uh, call back a little bit of my uh, of no of my past. And I must say, I enjoyed the other presentations very much. And it is something special to grow up in a small Plotteland town. But uh, I'm sitting these days in Cape Town, and I bring you greetings and salutations, as uh, Francis Drake said, from the fairest Cape in all the world. I uh, will now take you 463 kilometers north along the SN1 to a small dusty Karoo town called Beaufort West. And uh, in this collage that I'm showing you at the moment, uh, it is so typical of a town. And that is that uh, Beaufort West uh, was, in fact, uh, established on a farm in uh, the sort of uh, period around about uh, uh, 1818. And that farm was owned by Abram de Klerk and was known as Hoi 
And it was virtually on that farm that the town of Beaufort West was laid out. And I think you can follow my pointer in the left-hand corner, you will see the coat of arms of Beaufort West. And if you look at the shield, you will see the typical portcullis or the sort of um, drawbridge gate with the chains. And that is from the shield of uh, the Earl of Beaufort. And the Earl of Beaufort was, in fact, Lord Charles Somerset's father. So the Somerset coat of arms is really incorporated within the Beaufort West coat of arms. And when you look at the animals on the left and on the right, it gives you an indication that the town is, in fact, an agricultural economy. Uh, the left hand is a merino ram, and the right hand side is the angora goat, which is the source of moher. And of course, we also at one stage had the ostrich farm, and uh, the ostrich is sort of more into the clan karoo rather than in the great karoo. Um, the town itself has a couple of firsts in that uh, it was the first municipality in 1837, and uh, this beautiful church and most of the country towns have a, uh, a Dutch Reformed church, which almost forms the centerpiece of the town. And uh, this uh, was, in fact, uh, the later addition, this steeple, the Gothic steeple, was a later addition to the original uh, church, which was built around about the 1870s. This uh, was added about 1896. Also, driving out of town uh, along the uh, the Diagas Pass, you get some beautiful rock formations, which we used to call the pillars. And uh, I see one of my cousins in the audience uh, today. Uh, he's in London, and I remember him doing a watercolor of this uh, structure that was on the road. And of course, in Beaufort West, the ubiquitous windmill is always there because that is how you actually pumped water uh, from uh, underground. So that is then just the short history of the town itself. And we then go on to what was the Jewish community's role in that particular town. And one of the famous sons of Beaufort West, of course, was Christian Barnard, who was, uh, and Joss will appreciate that, he was first at practice as a GP in series. And uh, he was born in 1922 in Beaufort West, and uh, he, in fact, was the son of uh, Adam Barnard, who was then a, uh, a preacher in the Engie Kerk, uh, also to the uh, colored community. I've done a bit of a collage here because this picture of the first heart transplant team has uh, some family significance to me. And if you follow my pointer, the lady there on the left-hand side, uh, where my pointer is at the moment, is my late sister-in-law, who used to work the Astrip machine, which measured the blood gases uh, during that uh, particular operation. Uh, just below that, where my point is now, you will see the uh, city of Cape Town made Professor Barnard a uh, free man of the city of Cape Town. And uh, that happened in 1968. So in 2018, which was about 50 years later, uh, that book was open, as were some of the other uh, artifacts of uh, Barnard uh, at the City Hall. And I was invited to, to that particular occasion. And that's when I was able to photograph the, the actual entry of his freedom of the city of Cape Town. Now, coming to the Jewish uh, community in Cape in Beaufort West, 
it's rather strange to start with the dead center of Beaufort West, but it has some significance and that's why I'm starting at the cemetery. Because from what I can glean, uh, the earliest Jewish settlers in Beaufort West were either of German or of British origin in the 1860s. And it was only around about 1881 that we saw the immigration of Eastern European Jewry from Lithuania and Latvia. And it was upon application from 10 Jewish uh, inhabitants of the town that a piece of land roughly 60 meters by 60 meters was allotted in March of 1879 against a hill which was known as the Powder Magazine Hill. In Afrikaans, we used to talk about the crate uh, copy, and that was probably where they had stored ammunitions and things in the early days. According to the Courier, which was a local newspaper in Beaufort West uh, the, uh, of 1879, the and by the way, that Courier was one of the oldest newspapers. I think it was first published in 1869. Uh, that newspaper probably is number two to Grocott's Mail, which was published in Grahamstown in the early days. And uh, the first person to be buried in that cemetery was the daughter of a Mrs. Norden, who lived in Carnarvon. Now, Carnarvon is a Karoo town where they've established that uh, new uh, um, uh, uh, radio telescope setup. And uh, that daughter was buried there uh, in 1879. So in point of fact, the cemetery was really the start of what we got to know about uh, Judaism in the early days in Beaufort West. The uh, gra uh, gravestone on my left, which I'm pointing out at the moment, you'll see is cracked. And unlike uh, the earthquake that happened in uh, Ceres, uh, this is simply the work of vandals who toppled the gravestones and many of them were broken and the fragments were put together by uh, Rabbi Silberhoft and others to try and put it together. And that's why you will notice that instead of the stones being at, uh, what, is, what were you saying there, Josh, about 30 or 40 degree angle, these are laid absolutely flat on the grave itself. One of the oldest gravestones is the one of Mr. Senior, and you will see that was 1881. Let's just uh, push that thing out of my way. Yeah, okay, 1881. And uh, so you can see uh, there were very early burials in the cemetery at Beaufort West, uh, really in uh, as early as 1879. Now we then move on to the community itself. And this is the shul in Beaufort West. And uh, uh, we are actually a year earlier than what you heard of Stellenbosch and Ceres, that the stone, the foundation stone there was laid in 1922. So we were a centenary year last year, but I'm afraid it passed uh, virtually unnoticed. This, this is the synagogue itself, and that synagogue uh, was in fact uh, uh, really established on a piece of land which was uh, bought for 600 pounds in a small side street in Beaufort West off Duncan Street called Union uh, Street and that was in fact uh, used for the erection of a synagogue and also the adjoining minister's house. Um, the shul could accommodate about 50 men downstairs and about 50 women in the uh, gallery. And round about uh, 1978, the synagogue and the adjoining house fell into disrepair. And in point of fact, uh, it was uh, really a miserable uh, building, but in order to try and sell it, and there, was, there were very few Jewish people left 
in Beaufort West uh, towards the end of the 70s. Uh, they eventually managed to repair it as best they could. And both the synagogue and the minister's house were actually sold to a Mr. G.T. Boerter uh, in uh, 1979 for the magnificent sum of 5,000 rond. Sadly, the synagogue is now empty and it is used mainly for storage. And the minister's house is actually occupied by one of Mr. Boerter's descendants. In fact, it's his daughter that lives there now. Uh, Two of my cousins who are on the, uh, who I noticed on the, uh, in the audience today, will remember just about this position where my pointer is. There was a wall and in that little courtyard, there was actually a, an, a, an apricot tree. And as kids, we always used to pick the apricots when the season came, when we were at the uh, show itself. Uh, so, in point of fact, uh, before the shul was built in uh, um, 1922 or uh, occupied in 1922, most of the services were conducted in the Lyric Hall, which was situated in Mankey Street. And that was largely due to the efforts of a man by the name of August Cohen. And he must have just sort of had some informal uh, congregations there um, and uh, it was only until the shul was built uh, that uh, something uh, really uh, happened and uh, as you can see the stone was laid by Mr. Isidore Buxt and we'll talk uh, a little bit later on about him too. Uh, according to the official census records it seems that the Jewish community reached its zenith around about 1936 and uh, by 1991 the total number of Jews left there was exactly one and today there's not a single Jew left in Beaufort West. Um, my recollection was sort of around about the 40s when Reverend Aaron Myberg came to Beaufort West and he came there in 1943 from a little uh, town called Middleburg. My father, my late father had a business there. And when he married my mother in that very synagogue in Beaufort West in uh, 1934, uh, he prevailed upon Reverend Myberg to leave Middleburg Cape, which was also a dying community and come to Beaufort West, which was a bigger community. And we were delighted that he did come there because not only did he perform the usual shechita or the ritual slaughtering, but he also taught the children in Haida and he conducted all the services uh, in the synagogue. And I think that by the time we got to around about 1960, the, uh, uh, when Reverend Myberg left Beaufort West, it seemed to toll the death knell on the Jewish presence uh, in the town. Around about 1961, there were still a couple of Jewish families left. Uh, and uh, I remember, I think it was Emil Nori was then uh, the chairman or, of the uh, congregation. And in order to try and keep that Jewish flame burning, uh, they actually engaged Major Jacob Potashnik, who used to come for their high holidays to uh, to Beaufort West to conduct the services. Um, Major Potashnik uh, got his ranking. He was, in fact, a chaplain to the Jewish servicemen in World War II. But uh, it used to be quite a, a, a thing that he, when he arrived, they used to say that the uh, Jewish minister had arrived for the high holidays. And they treated him very, very royally when he did uh, get there. But sadly, the major impact and the invaluable contribution of the Jews of yesteryear played in Beaufort West life uh, is obviously just lost in the mists of time. 
Um, I think it was Benjamin Disraeli, who was the prime minister in the UK many years ago, uh, said that they are indeed a nation of shopkeepers. And in Beaufort West, it was not very much different. This was my late uncle's uh, shop in New Street. Uh, he was Charlie Dubovitz. And uh, two of his sons both became medical people. Uh, Leslie went to the United States, practiced as uh, an occupational uh, medical officer there. And then Victor uh, retired as the professor at Imperial College. He's probably a world authority on muscle dystrophy in children. He was professor of pediatrics. And uh, he, in fact, I think the, the muscle research unit at Imperial College is named the uh, Dubovitz uh, Research Unit. Right next to my uncle's shop was a fish shop, which was run by Mrs. Golda Soskin, whose picture you'll see there on the right, holding a lovely little dog. Uh, Mrs. Soskin was a dear old lady, but uh, also had a lot of personal tragedy because when she came to Beaufort West as a young woman uh, with her late husband, Morris, uh, she was left a widow very early. And funnily enough, her son, Philip, was also died as a very young man. And in fact, all three are buried in the Beaufort West uh, Cemetery. But the reason I'm mentioning that is to also show you the types of little shops that the uh, Jewish people in Beaufort West ran. But the late Mrs. Soskin was a compassionate lady and a dear soul and loved animals. The, every stray cat that walked in Beaufort West found refuge in her place. And she was a very uh, wonderful person to that. In fact, uh, it was her grandson that contacted me. And that is uh, a picture that he sent me. But it's exactly as I remembered his uh, grandmother uh, as a young boy. Now, my father was at one stage the secretary of the shul. And in those days, they never worried about telephones. He would uh, send me on my bicycle to visit all the uh, Jewish people in Beaufort West with a notice. And if the people had read the notice, they would sign and I would bring that notice back to my father. So if there was a visiting uh, speaker or whatever, then that would be the way of notifying the community. So I pictured myself riding on my bicycle down the various streets. And I then thought about all the Jewish enterprises that were in Beaufort West during my sort of period that I lived there, starting at my father's little store in, in Church Street, and Baumgarten and his sons, both Jack and Cecil, were on the corner of uh, 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 New Street and Church Street. Then you'd seen my Uncle Charlie's uh, shop uh, that was also in New Street, Mrs. Soskin's fish shop. Leo Shattle was a brother-in-law to my Uncle Charlie, and he also practiced in that area. And then there was the butchery that was run by Teddy Schneider. And then I would turn down Mankey Street and come down Duncan Street, which was the uh, which was the main street of Beaufort West. And then you would come across a store called Glatt and Norrie, which was the two uh, Miss Glatts and their nephew, Emil Norrie. Uh, with Emil, uh, the Norris are in the catering business in Cape Town and a very well-known family. But uh, Emil uh, was actually on his way to, to uh, varsity in Cape Town. And I think one of the Glatts had died and they asked Emil whether he would sort of stand in there. And uh, that uh, the rest is history, as they say. And he stayed on. Uh, he was virtually the last uh, one uh, to leave uh, Beaufort West. Then we had Philip Gordon at MG Furnishing, and I've already mentioned the newspaper called The Courier and uh, the National Theatre, which was our local movie house. And that was run by a gentleman called Mike Bellin. Uh, Mike Bellin had a son, and you will see a picture of him later on. He was in uh, one year ahead of me at school. 
And he also went to study medicine at UCT and uh, later on became the professor of radiology at Cleveland University in the United States. Then we came down, uh, still going down uh, uh, Duncan Street, you'd come across a very nice drapery shop, which was run by Libman Maggot and his wife, Mary. Uh, my late aunt, Sarah Maiman, had a shop in Donkin Street on the corner of Footrecker Street and Donkin Street. And then we came across uh, Mr. Goldenbaum. Uh, we used to know him, uh, know him as uh, uh, Schmil, but he was actually Samuel Goldenbaum. And Samuel Goldenbaum's shop burned down when I was still a young lad in Beaufort West. Uh, we'll talk about that later on also because because he had two really uh, sons who remained, one remained in Beaufort West. Uh, Jackie was a farmer there. They had two farms, uh, Hans Rafir and Popdom. And then the other one left Beaufort West and went to Wits to qualify as a dentist, uh, A.B. Goldenbaum. Uh, then my two uncles, Hamka Stores was run by Jack Dubowitz and Riverside Stores by my uncle Ben uh, Dubovitz. And later on, as you go down, there was the Oasis Cafe and the bakery that was uh, started by a, a great entrepreneur by the name of Sam Jacobs. Uh, Sam, unfortunately, was killed in a motor car smash about 60 or 80 kilometers from Beaufort West near Leochamka. And he started this lovely Oasis hotel, restaurant, and so on, and he was followed by uh, Mr. Miller. Unfortunately, I don't remember his first name, but his son was a student of mine and did pharmacy at the time, uh, was Victor Miller. The hotels were also run by a lot of Jewish people. The uh, First of all, there was Morris and Nathan Garb, and they were then followed by Albert Kaplan. The Masonic Hotel was run by Solly Bloomberg, and there was a bottle store that was first run by Mr. Belinsky, who eventually translocated to uh, Weddy Road in uh, Musenberg, and, and his uh, successor was Simon Silk. Of course, when it came to motor car dealers, the central dealer for Ford was the Carew Trading Company. And there were no less than about four or five, no, maybe six Jewish families involved. Uh, Isaac Carabas uh, and his brother Joe and Joe's son, eldest son, Ruby, they were all in the business. Morris Carabas actually came from Victoria West, where the Ford dealership was run by his father, the late Charlie Carabas. And Morris uh, came afterwards to uh, take over the garage because Isaac had moved to Cape Town to Kenilworth and uh, he also sired two brilliant sons. Uh, the one, the elder one, Alan, uh, qualified in law and eventually became a professor at several American universities and in his later years he came to the University of the Western Cape. Uh, the other son, Cyril, who was the youngest, uh, became a pediatrician, and he, in fact, uh, uh, became a, a professor also and uh, specialized in uh, pediatric oncology. Uh, then there was um, Izzy Javen, who was sort of the uh, man who did the uh, admin. He also became a gubber in the shul, Dan Pincus, and Jack Blitz looked after the uh, the uh, technical side of the business. Uh, then uh, as the farmers go, I did mention Jack Goldenbaum. Jack went to Grootfontein College in Middleburg and he became, uh, uh, got his uh, uh, agricultural qualification there and then came to farm on uh, the farms that they owned. Then there was Benny Frank who farmed about 40 kilometers from Beaufort West in a small little place called Kreitfontein. And uh, that was near near uh, Leochamka or what was early known as Prince Alfred Road. And then there was the Horvitzes and Isaac Levin. Uh, they were farming near Ritbron, which is also a little distance from Beaufort West. Now, Mrs. Uh, Goldenbaum was a Horvitz. And those were her brothers. 
but she also had an uncle and we used to refer to him as Mesha, but he was uh, Moses uh, Horowitz and he used to uh, also come to shul and uh, many of those who uh, will remember him well. Uh, of the professional side, the man that I suppose I should be grateful for, for delivering me, was Dr. Harold Lee. Uh, Harold was actually the railway doctor, because in those days, Beaufort West was a great railway center, and that's where they used to uh, re-fix uh, up the trains when it came to supplying them with water for those locomotives. Uh, also had uh, the um, workshops, and uh, they uh, he then serviced uh, and looked after all those railway people, whether they were engine drivers or stokers or just simply fitters and turners. He was the appointed doctor for the railway in Beaufort West. And uh, he later on was moved to uh, Woodstock in Cape, in Cape Town, and his son, Alan, the late Alan Lee, took over that practice. While I was in Beaufort West, there was also a Jewish doctor by the name of Rotovsky, and I don't know his first name, but he didn't make a long sojourn in Beaufort West. I think he was only there for a couple of months. Of the dentists, the, we had Julius Jacobson, who came from DR and practiced in Brummer's practice and eventually landed up back in Cape Town in Seapoint. Of the pharmacists of the town, the uh, pharmacist was uh, Hillel Friedman, who owned Michael's Pharmacy, and one of my cousins worked for his uncle. Uh, you might say Dubovitz, but that was the Friedman was on his mother's side. His mother was a Friedman, but she was married to my uncle Ben Dubovitz, and Norman was my first cousin who worked for his uncle in uh, Beaufort West. Of the attorneys that were practicing in Beaufort West, the only one that I remember was Max Weinberg, and he eventually translocated to Belleville in the northern suburbs. But you'll hear more about Max Weinberg in the next slide, probably. Because in 1941, on the 6th of April, a flood hit Beaufort West and virtually wiped the town out. Um, we were living in Church Street at the time, and uh, these were photographs that were taken by the late Max Weinberg, and his son was also a medical man, a pediatrician, probably a world authority on asthma and other respiratory complaints and allergies in children, practiced at the Red Cross Hospital. And Eugene shared these photographs with me, but you'll see they were all black and white photographs. But what was interesting, what was written at the back is of historical significance. That marked number one where my pointer is at the moment was my <laughs> late <laughs> Uncle Charlie's shop before it was refurbished and you saw the finished article in a previous slide. That was Mrs. Soskin's fish shop. And right there, number three, was where the Levies were living. And in fact, if you look at what he had written in his handwriting on the back of that, that Mr. Levy had to be rescued from the stoop by several men who were roped together, so high the water was. <coughs> then there was another photograph taken down Donkin Street uh, from the Masonic Hotel corner. And that Masonic Hotel stood on the corner of Church Street and Donkin Street. Other photographs is looking down New Street, and you can see this raging torrent there. But this was more important to me because that was the Queen's Hotel where my pointer is at the moment. And right opposite the Queen's Hotel was my dad's business, which was Jack's store. And you will realize that I was all of just about two years old when this flood came down. Uh, the Hamka River washed away the railway bridge, so there was no connection between the town and the railway. And uh, in fact, Baumgarten's Corner uh, is this part over here, which was on the corner of New Street and Church Street. 
And uh, it was on, on that basis that uh, we went to live with my grandmother, who was in the lower part of uh, Beaufort West. And uh, that is where I suppose we dried out. But my father was a sentimental old man and the mud mark, which showed the height that the water flowed during that particular uh, flood uh, was marked on his wall and he never ever painted that wall in his shop. So he could proudly show everybody exactly how high that water ran when we had that flood, uh, well, well, almost 80 years ago. The next slide shows you a picture of the cemetery, which you can see is still walled. But sadly, where my point is now, there is no gate. The place is sometimes inhabited by vagrants. And it is, uh, when I visited it, it was reasonably clean. And that thanks to Rabbi Silberhoff who visited the cemetery from time to time, cleaned up. Uh, when I go down there from time to time, we try and clean up as well. But I'm afraid that it is open. This is not quite how it used to be because the Tahara house used to be abutting Thompson Street. But when they widened Thompson Street, the Tahara house was rebuilt on the northern side of the cemetery, just about where my pointer is now. The wall I'm pointing on is actually the Muslim cemetery. And the municipality asked the congregation, please, to uh, remove the Tahara house because that was a haven for the vagrants. And uh, all that standing of the Tahara house or the vestiges of it is, in fact, the foundation. Uh, the uh, tombstone there is my late grandfather's tombstone. And you can see I was named after him. And this is an early photograph of 1918. And uh, that is my grandfather, the second from the left, where I'm pointing at the moment. And right next to him was his good friend, Mr. Buxt, who actually um, laid the foundation stone. My grandfather could uh, daven sakrit and other things. And he also took a very uh, uh, great interest in the synagogue. But you can see where these guys are sitting are bales of wool. And that was what my grandfather was involved in, uh, in the produce side of uh, things, either hides and skins or wool. And in fact, my Uncle Charlie took over virtually that uh, uh, sort of role because he was also uh, in that uh, type of uh, business. This is the tombstone of August Cohen. And August Cohen, as I mentioned earlier on, he was the one who uh, came to Beaufort West from Munich. He was born there. And as I told you, the early Jews were mostly German Jews or uh, Jews from uh, Britain. Uh, Cohen actually uh, started a business there, general dealer's business in 1872. And that was cited on 71 and 73 New Street. And he joined into partnership with another German Jew by the name of Brush. Uh, when Brush died, uh, the business was known as Cohen and Brush. But when Brush died, Cohen and his brother uh, amalgamated and they opened up a business a few doors away on 81 New Street. And that was called Cohen Brothers the actual uh, business itself. Uh, Cohen was a remarkable man. He died in 1921, but he served on the municipal council for 24 years and he was even the deputy mayor, but he seemed to like uh, things associated with the youth. And he served on the, as a school board secretary for many, many years. Um, he, in point of fact, uh, uh, started a, a soup kitchen when the uh, great Spanish flu uh, epidemic hit us in 1918-19. Uh, he and his wife 
uh, started the soup kitchen at their uh, very fancy uh, mansion called Winchelsea House. Now, Win Winchelsea House was eventually broken down, and that was the site where the Oasis Hotel was erected on Duncan Street. I'm showing you this because a man by the name of August Cohen was a great doctor too. He was one of the most dedicated sport doctors in South Africa. And those of you who watch rugby games at Newlands will remember Augie Cohen uh, along the sidelines. He also acted as a Springbok team doctor, and we refer to him as Augie Cohen. But now you can see where he got the name August from. He actually inherited that from his grandfather because his father uh, was actually took over the business after uh, August uh, died. And he was probably born in Beaufort West in 1927. Mm -hmm. And uh, he died in Cape Town in 2015 at the age of 88. And he was almost revered by Western Province Rugby. As you can see, the Dizer uh, is a Western Province Rugby uh, sort of uh, flower. Now, looking back to Beaufort West, and I did mention Isaac Carabas. In the Beaufort West Club, there is a certificate where Isaac Carabas was issued with 15 shares in the Beaufort West Club. And you will see that the Beaufort West Club was started in 1926. In, uh, uh, 19, uh, in 2016, it celebrated its 90th birthday. And I was present at that celebration. And in point of fact, uh, the farmers had donated three sheep for that party. And they were doing those sheep on a braai in the back of the club. And uh, uh, it was just an interesting bit of, his, uh, of Africana to see a, an original certificate of one of the shareholders and he happened to be a Jew. And the only other Jewish member of the club was myself. And I was awarded uh, honorary life membership of the club about uh, three years prior to the 90th anniversary of the club. So I'm hoping if uh, the almighty spares me that I will be at the centenary of the Beaufort West Club in 2026 if uh, that is still possible. Now, this is the original house of Lippmann Maggot. We refer to him as Lippy Maggot. Uh, Lippy was a man who was a very erudite in Jewish uh, things. He studied at the Tills Yeshiva. He was the honorary cousin of the shul, virtually from my birth date right through to 55. He had one daughter, Sylvia, who was sort of my contemporary. And uh, Lippmann Maggot, uh, as I mentioned to you, you saw that he had this wonderful drapery shop just across the road from the Merino Co-op. Uh, and he was very high up in the Masonic order. In fact, he became the Grand Master. Uh, this was the house in Duncan Street. But you can see it has been transmogrified to a certain extent and has now become a lodge. But right next door to Lippi's uh, house was a stone uh, manse that belonged to the High Church of England uh, or the Anglican Church. And that used to be our scout hall in the early days. That is the house which my late father built at 144 Bird Street, Beaufort West. And that's where I spent <clears throat> most of my years. Um, it was a lovely uh, house, and it was just around the corner from many of my cousins living uh, around the corner from us and my grandmother. And in that house, there was a most magnificent almond tree and I took this photograph. It was the first tree that used to blossom in the spring. And attached to that almond tree, there was a piece of metal. 
that the during the Anglo Boer War they must have hitched horses to that tree, and that piece of metal was there all those years, as I remember it. And uh, this was the house right next door to the pastorie or the parsonage of the Dutch Reformed Church of not the one that I showed you, but of another community known as the Chamka Us community. And I saw all the Dominis come and go uh, there. And in fact, when the Chamka Us church was first uh, inaugurated, my parents and I, we were invited to that inauguration. But there was always a great uh, uh, relationship besides me playing with the Dominis sons and I need to hardly tell you the naughtiest boys that ever were made was a Domini son. And uh, uh, Matey, this is uh, Gavin. We've got about five minutes left before the end of the um, end of the session. So I'd like to uh, just give people a bit of time to uh, ask some questions. So I don't know how much longer you've got in your talk, but I've, I've just got uh, exactly one more slide or two uh, more okay. slides to go. All so right. I'm I'm running according to time. So okay, I'm, we just leave some time for questions. Thanks. Okay. That was my standard two to four class. And you'll notice there's an E behind it. And that was the English class because they were English and Afrikaans classes at the primary school. In that class, there were three, three Jewish boys. That was Errol Bellin that I referred to earlier on. This was a young lad by the name of Isaac Mofsovitz who came to Beaufort West for the dry climate because he had a terrible asthma problem in Cape Town. And that's yours truly, smiling widely. And we had no Arbonim or Beta or any of those Jewish movements. So most of us joined the Boy Scouts. And in point of fact, that's me over there in the background. And two of my cousins were also in the Boy Scout movement. That is Leslie, who I did speak about earlier on. And that is one of my other cousins, uh, Leonard Dubovitz, who lives in Canada. And I did achieve something while I was there. I became a Queen Scout. And uh, you can see the, uh, the certificate signed by Elizabeth R. Uh, on your right hand side. And that takes me to the end of my presentation. And uh, I had the dubious honor of uh, being presented with a certificate when I turned 70 years of age by the mayor of Beaufort West. And I was then elevated to the dubious honor of being an honorary citizen of the town. So uh, yeah, you can take Nati Finkelstein out of Beaufort West, but you can't take the Karoo out of Nati Finkelstein. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks, Nati. Uh, let's just uh, finish sharing your screen so we can see everyone else. There we go. Um, does anybody have any questions for, for Nati? Don't have uh, to have questions. I can comment as well. If ah, I've left yeah. as well. anything out or inaccurate. You know, well, um, from my perspective, Nati, thank you for uh, mentioning Mama Khatenesin. Um, and uh, I'm wondering if there's something in the water that produces pediatricians from Beaufort West. There seems to be a fair few. Myra, Myra Goldenbaum wanted to say something. Can you unmute Myra? Um, I just wanted to say that my father-in-law came from both the Dwess, Louis Goldenbaum. He had a yes. bottle store. Was I was only... aware of I was aware of Louis. He was uh, he had moved to Kimberley, but he That's was right. related. He was related to Sam Goldenbaum. They, they were, were brothers. brothers. Yeah. Correct. Yes, I was aware of him and he used to uh, come on odd visits. Uh, I remember him well, tall man, dark black hair, uh, when I remembered him. 
and he used to come and visit the Golden Bombs in Beaufort West, and sometimes I saw him at Shaw uh, when he was there. Yeah, I've got some photos which I'll get your email and I'll send them to you. Of Thank Beaufort you so West. much. Um, Thank you. Yes, and uh, he, he, Sam was his brother. Yes, correct. And um, Charmian wanted to say something. Hello. Am I unmuted? You're unmuted. Nate, hi, Charmian. How are you? <laughs> All the way from the United States. I, I, I should have mentioned Charmian that you were the last wedding in Beaufort West when you married Leonard. Is, is, isn't that correct? 100% correct. And your talk was wonderful, Nate. You brought back such memories. Okay. And the graveyard was our favorite place for our walk when we were children because it was so interesting. And just loved all your reminiscences, brought it all back. So thank you so much. Pleasure. Nice of you to join us. Thank you. Bye. Have you, got a, have you got a video, Damien, um, which you could switch on so we could see you? Oh, no, it's too early in the morning. <laughs> I'm on my way to <laughs> jail. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Yeah, Shamian, Shamian was, in fact, uh, the Bellins had three daughters and the son I mentioned, Errol. Uh, Shamian was the youngest of the three daughters. And when she married a medical man, I think his name was Leonard Muller, or Muller, um, yeah. then uh, she was the last wedding in the Beaufort West Synagogue. In the garden mm. of the Royal Hotel Annex. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Nati. Bye. Okay, bye. Folks, uh, that brings us to about two hours since we started. Um, I'm going to close the. Um, I'm going to close the conversation. I'll leave Zoom open if you if uh, anybody still wants to speak. Um, remember, we're going to do this uh, another session next week at the same time. Uh, that's Tuesday the fourth. Uh, sorry, Tuesday, not Wednesday. Tuesday the fourteenth at two o'clock South African time, uh, and that will be a little bit more uh, hands on on how to go about uh, celebrating and remembering the places and the communities that you grew up in, in an online space. I'm aware we didn't get to hear the rest of uh, Gerald's presentation. So uh, Gerald, hopefully next week we can uh, we can pick that up as well and give you the opportunity to finish the story about Stellenbosch. Um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, as I say, I will leave the Zoom on if you want to uh, have a little chasels and enjoy uh, each other's company for a while. Uh, thank you for joining us and see you next week. Thank, thank you, Gavin. And if I can say thank you to all the speakers who've been really wonderful, really bringing up to us yeah. the feelings and the thoughts of growing up in these places. So it's been a really wonderful opportunity. So thank you so much to all four of you. And next week, we will be looking at Stellenbosch as an example of how one could put all these memories into a, um, a web space where you can find the things and look for them. So I hope that you'll all join us then on Tuesday when Bramie um, Lenoff, who's been helping to make this wonderful uh, place, will, will join us and um, we'll look at how to do this uh, together. So thank you very much, everybody, and thanks, Gavin. And um, um, see you next week. Thank you.